Hello and welcome to section 7, working with Horizon Desktop Pools. In this section we're going to look at creating our desktop pools for the end users to be able to connect and start using their virtual desktop machines. In this section we're going to create a number of desktop pools using the virtual desktop machine images we created in the previous sections. We're going to create a Windows 7 full clone pool, a Windows 10 linked clone pool, a Windows 10 instant clone pool and a Windows 7 manual desktop pool. Finally, with our pools created, we'll untitle the end users to these pools so that they can access their desktop machines. So now let's move on to the first video of this section and create the first desktop pool in the example lab environment. In this particular video, we're going to create a desktop pool which will use a full clone image of the Windows 7 gold image that we created. This pool will also have a persistent assignment, meaning that a user will effectively own their own desktop. So now we're going to go ahead and create our first desktop pool and this one's for our Windows 7 gold image. So we've logged on to our Horizon View Administrator console as you can see here and then we are presented with our dashboard screen. So to create a desktop pool we go to the inventory section on the left hand side, click catalog and then click the option for desktop pools. And now we see our screen for desktop pools where we have the options that we can select on the desktop pool section. So more commands, access groups, the status of pools, entitlements, and the button that we're looking for, the add button. So we click the add button and now we can see the add desktop pool configuration screen. And the first option is to select a desktop pool definition and the type of desktop pool that we're going to create. So for this example, we're going to create an automated desktop pool. We could also create a manual desktop pool, which we'll do in a later section, or an RDS pool if we're going to have published desktops and applications. So make sure we click the radio button for automated desktop pool. We do have some hints and tips on the right hand side, so it tells us here what an automated desktop pool is all about, and the supported features of so the said desktop pool type so that it supports instant clones, vCenter virtual machines, the View Composer, the Blast protocol, PC over IP, and persona management. So we're going to click next to continue. And the next option is user assignment. How's this desktop going to be assigned to the user or the desktop in this desktop pool? Are they going to be dedicated, i.e. is an owner going to use it and keep it and it's going to be their own desktop? Or is it going to be floating? Whereas they log in to the desktop pool and each time they log in they receive a different desktop. So for this pool we're going to go dedicated and then we also have the checkbox here for enable automatic assignment. That basically means that the desktop will be assigned to the user automatically rather than you go and manually select which desktop they get. Again we have some hints and tips and supported features on the right hand side. So click next to continue. And now we see our vCenter server screen. So this is the type of build that we're going to have. So are we going to build the desktops using instant clones, view composer linked clones, or are they going to be full virtual machines? So in this case, we're going to go for full virtual machines as we're going to build a full clone desktop pool. And then we'll see here our vCenter server pop up in the options box. So we need to click that to select it. So that's where the virtual machines are going to be coming from that we're going to create for this desktop pool. Click next to continue and the first thing we see now is the desktop pool identification. So we need to give this pool an ID. So we're going to call this Win7, we're going to call it Full Clone and then in the display name we need to give this a name that's going to be friendly to the users because this is the name that gets displayed in the Horizon clients when they log in. So try and steer clear of codes and numbers. Make it quite clear as to what the desktop is. So in this case, we're just going to call it Windows 7 VM. Then we can create an access group. We don't have any access groups. And then we have also got the description box. So we could give this a description so that would actually describe what the pool is. When you're happy with that, click next to continue. And now we see the first of our pool settings screens. And this is broken into several sections. So general, remote display, 
and then at the bottom Adobe Flash and Mirage. So for general, the state is either enabled or disabled. So in this case, the pool is enabled, meaning that users can access desktops within the pool. We can configure connection server restrictions. So if we click on browse, so we can have no restrictions. So that means this pool can be accessed from any connection server. Or if we configured a tag onto the connection server, we'd see these tags listed here. So that would mean that this pool would only be resourced by connection servers with the tag that we choose. Then we have a category folder. So this is basically the ability to create a new folder shortcut on the desktop pool. So in this case, we've got this disabled, but we could select a category from here. We could add a new folder and we could add shortcuts to either the start menu or the launcher or the desktop of the machines. So next we have remote settings. So the first option here is remote machine power policy. So what do we do in the event of the power policy? So that's take no power action. We can always ensure that machines are powered on. We could suspend machines or you could power them off. So we're going to leave that as take no power option. Next we have automatically log off after disconnect. So what do you want to do when the user logs off? So if they do a Windows log off, do you want to disconnect them from the session immediately? Never or after 120 minutes, for example, or maybe 60 minutes. So that's basically, you don't want to set this too low because if the end user has a network issue, for example, with just a small glitch, you don't want to disconnect them from their session. So we'll leave this as never. So that basically means that they don't get logged off if they disconnect. Then we have the option to allow users to reset, restart their machines. That's a simple yes or no. We'll say no in this case. Then we're on to the remote display protocol options. So the first one is what is the default display protocol? So what's the virtual machine going to use by default? We start with Blast as the actual default that it puts in straight away. And we can choose that to PC over IP or RDP. So we'll leave that as Blast for now. Do we want the user to choose the protocol? Yes or no? So basically, if you say yes here, it means that they can go in and choose the protocol that they use to connect to their desktop. So a use case here is if this was set to PC over IP, for example, you probably want to put this to yes, because often you may find that port 4172, the port used by PC over IP, is blocked. That would mean the user would not get their desktop. So therefore, they want to come in, change, and they manually would maybe want to change to Blast or RDP. So depending on whether or not you think that's going to happen, you can choose yes or no to allow users to change the protocol. Then we have the 3D renderer model. So we can have automatic. So view decides what that's going to be, what's going to be used to do the 3D rendering. Software, as it says, 3D rendering will be done in software. We can do it in hardware, or we can do it using NVIDIA Grid GPU, or we can have this disabled. So we're going to go for automatic. We also have a configure button here, which then allows us to configure the virtual memory for graphics. So it's just a case of a slider here to slide up to what we want. Minimum 64 meg, maximum of 512 meg for our video memory. Next, how many monitors do we want? That is also dependent on the protocol and rendering models. So we have one or two monitors. There are question marks by the side of these. You can click those quite happily and it will tell you what that setting consists of. So it talks about when 3D is disabled, what resolutions monitors will support, and obviously select fewer monitors if you want a higher resolution. There's always some notes next to it if you are stuck as to what that means. Next, maximum resolution of the monitor. So we can choose right up to kind of 4K or standard HD at 1920 and those in between. So we'll leave that as the 1920 by 1200. Do we want this desktop pool to be accessed using the web browser? Tick for enabled or don't tick if you want it disabled. So we'll tick that, so that means this desktop pool could be accessed via the browser. And do you want to allow session collaboration? The ability to share sessions between users to share documentation, etc. Note that you have to have Blast for this to work. So bear in mind that even if you choose PC over IP, 
this option is still here. So if you have chosen PC over IP and you have checked that box and wonder why it doesn't work, that's because it only works on Blast. Next, Adobe Flash settings. So do we want to control the quality of Flash, low, medium or high? This is going to be dependent on the amount of bandwidth that it's going to take. And then also we can throttle the Flash building. So we can go conservative, moderate or aggressive. Again, this will take up more bandwidth the more you add. And finally, we have a Mirage setting here. If you've already used Mirage, Mirage is now end of life, where you can override these settings and have Mirage put those in for you as part of a desktop configuration. If you're happy with all of those settings, next to continue. And now we're on our provisioning settings. So the first part here is basic. So we want to enable provisioning. So we want the desktops to be built in the desktop pool. We also want to stop provisioning if there's an error. So for example, if you had, let's say, a thousand machines being built and there was an error on number one, you wouldn't want to build the other 999 machines with the said same error. You'd want to stop work out what the error is, correct it, and then come back and provision again. Next, we have virtual machine naming. So here we can specify names manually, and we can just enter the names here. So basically a list of names that get allocated to the machines as they're built. Or in this case, we're going to use a naming pattern. So basically in here, we can call this a name that means something to you, but we can also have it automatically number. So in this example, we're going to Call it this. So win7, we're going to do dash fc dash, and then we're going to do open curly bracket and an n and a close curly bracket. So that basically means it's going to make virtual machines that are called win7 dash fc dash 1 dash 2 dash 3 up to the number of machines that you've asked it to create, which is our next section desktop pool sizing. So what is the maximum number of virtual machines in this pool? So we're going to say two, and the number of spare machines. So how many have we got powered on ready? So we'll say one. So we've always got one ready out of a maximum of two. Next, provisioning. When are they going to be built? So are we going to provision them on demand when end user logs in and says, hey, I want a virtual machine. View goes away and builds it for them on demand. Or are we going to build them all up front, i.e. when we press the go button, all two of those machines, all 500 of those machines, all 1,000, whatever it is, all get built at once. When you do that, make sure you have the infrastructure in place to do it. So, for example, don't do it in the middle of the day where you might provision a 1,000 desktop machines, for example, and then you're just going to kill your storage while you build those machines. And then finally, on provisioning settings, we have the option for a virtual device, and that virtual device being a virtual trusted platform module. So do we want one of those or don't we want one of those? When you're happy with those settings, we're going to click next to continue. And then we have our storage policy management. So this is for our VMware virtual SAN. So this isn't available. We haven't got a vSAN configured in our deployment here. So we're just going to click next to go past that. So now we need to configure our vCenter settings. And these settings relate to what virtual machine are we going to use? So in this case, because we're creating a full clone, that's going to be built from a template, the templates that we built earlier. So we need to tell View where that template is. Obviously, it's on vCenter, hence why it's called vCenter settings. So we only have one. That's our Windows 7 gold image. So it's picked out our templates that are stored on our vCenter server. So that's our template, our Windows 7 gold image. So we click OK to select that. Now we need our virtual machine location. So where are we going to put it? So we're going to put it in our PVO data center and click OK. Next, resource settings. Who's going to run it? What's it going to run on? So we're going to choose our host or cluster. And then our resource pool. So these are all vSphere options. So which resource pool is that going to run? So that's our ESX host and click OK. And finally, where is it going to be stored on which actual data store? That's going on our VM data store. So we're going to check the box for that and then click OK. So now we've completed our vCenter settings. We click Next to continue. And now we have some advanced storage options. So we can click the box here to use View Storage Accelerator. And the View Storage Accelerator is disabled to regenerate after this many days. We don't have it switched on here. And then we have blackout times. So the blackout times is 
when it shouldn't do any regeneration because regeneration is going to make disk noise that's going to have a performance impact. We also then at the bottom have transparent page sharing scopes. Is that going to be shared across virtual machines? Is it going to be shared across the machines in the pool, in the pod, or all of them? So that's a relatively new setting to be able to set transparent page sharing across your virtual desktop machines. When you've configured this box, click next to continue. And then we have our guest customization. So this is basically preparing the desktop machine as you want it. So we can either not do any customization and go in afterwards manually and build the desktop configuration. So we also there have the option to not power it on, so we can do that manually and control it. Or we could use this customization specification, and then basically what that's going to do is look on our vCenter and look for our customization scripts. We don't have any here, but it would appear in this box here. We'd select that and it would apply that. So um, some form of sysprep file that we've already created the answer file. That file may well contain host names, DNS settings, and such like. So we're going to say none, and we'll click next to continue. And then finally, we have the ready to complete box. So this is going to basically give us a summary of all of those things we've selected. So now's the time to go through to make sure that we've chosen all of the right settings, or if we want to change something, we can literally click on back to go back a page, or we can select individually from the left hand side which ones we want to go back and manually change. You'll also note here that we have a checkbox for entitle end users after this wizard finishes. So if I check that box, what's going to happen is when I finish and the desktops are built, it's going to launch the entitlement page. So that means I can add users to the desktop pool to enable them to use it. We're going to do that in a section after this. So for now, we're just going to click finish and then let's view go ahead with vCenter, go build those desktops. So now we've come back to our view administrator screen. We can see here now, here's our win7-fc. Remember that was the ID. That's the display name, the type of pool. It's a vCenter pool, dedicated assignment using that vCenter. We don't have any people enabled or entitled to this yet. The desktop pool is enabled, so if we do entitle people, they could use it. We didn't create any shortcuts, and because we don't have anyone entitled, then clearly we don't have any sessions running right now. So now you'd be able to go up here and do entitlements, you'd be able to disable the group if we click and highlight it. So we could disable the pool, we could disable provisioning, stop that from happening. We could go and add entitlements, we could go and change to a new access group or change it. And then in more commands, we can view unentitled machines or unentitled policies. We could clone the pool, delete it, edit it, takes us back into our settings, and then add for a new desktop pool. So just to have a look to see what the outcome of our desktop pool configuration was, here we can see on recent tasks, so we've switched back to our vSphere client. So here on our recent tasks, we can see that it's cloned the virtual machine called it win7-fc2. We asked it to build one up front. So we can see all of that happen. And then what we can see here is in our inventory, we can see our win7-fc2. And then we can see that that VM is built and it's ready for an end user to log into. So that completes our first desktop pool configuration.